In this video, I'm going to go over a solution to the echo exercise. Now, as with all the exercises, I recommend that you attempt this without going through this solution video first. Also, I need to say that this question itself originally came from a Coursera course, Introduction to Programming with MATLAB by Vanderbilt University. I'll include a link to that in the video description. If you are taking that course, please do not use this content to cheat. My grading policy, my cheating policy in my class, is that if you come across an answer to a question, if you can read it and understand it, and then close it away, don't refer back to it, but then from the knowledge that you've gained, answer the question, well then you've learned something. And that's the goal of the course, right? That's the goal of, of hopefully any learning. So please use this content uh, in a way in which it is intended. Now I have modified the original Vanderbilt University question to go in very incremental stages, very, very small step sizes in an attempt to make this easier to complete. So I'm going to go through it with you right now. All of this code, with a tiny, tiny exception, does work in Octave exactly as it works here in MATLAB. Now, before I run this first section, here's the exception. Load. When I load Gong, or I load Splat, or I load these other built-in audio files, so like MATLAB comes with just a bunch of audio files as samples, Octave does not contain those same audio files. I recommend if you want to manipulate audio files in Octave, there's a few different ways you can do it. Please refer to this web page right here. There'll be a link to this in the video description, audio data processing in Octave. And one of the things I did just to test my code to see if it worked is I just used record right here. So what I did in Octave is I said y equals record, and then I just did a little three second recording. And I did that instead of this right here. Now, in fact, the other thing that you would need to do is I also did this. So I just did 8,000. So uh, I ran these two lines of code instead of this line right here in Octave. Now, you have to be like speaking or making noise, and you have to have some audio input to your computer for three seconds in order for it to work, but it worked perfectly for me, and uh, that's something you can do in place of this or any of the other loads that I do in this file. But otherwise, the code works in Octave. Okay, so let's run this example right here. All right, so what I just did was I loaded in Gong. What that does is it puts into the workspace two variables, Y and capital F, lowercase s. Y is simply a vector of numbers. We can see here that Y has a roughly 42,000 rows, one column, and capital FS is the sampling frequency, saying that in order to play this vector y as an audio clip, we should read in and play out roughly 8,000 of those numeric values per second. And so when I pass y and fs to the sound function, which you can do in octave as well, it plays out that sound that you just heard. I can also plot y as a vector, as a numeric vector. And here's what our gong looks like with time on the x-axis. And I put magnitude on the y-axis, I should be more familiar with audio terms. That might be amplitude. I'm not exactly sure, but anyway, something like that on the y-axis. Now, one thing to note is that we are assuming mono audio files, not stereo. And you can read more about any audio requirements right here. Um, but you can read in your own audio files. You don't have to use built-in MATLAB ones. But if you have MATLAB, like this is going to work for you. All right, continuing on down. Uncomment the following and fill in the blanks to display the first five values in the vector y. So really basic here. I just want to put in a 1 and a 5 and show that, hey, look, y is a vector of numbers. These all happen to be negative small numbers, but that's fine. y is a vector of numbers. And how about the next one? Use the size function to display the number of rows and columns in y. Well, I actually already did this, but here I'll do it again. And there we go. So 42,000 rows, one column. Now, the audio file that I actually want to work with is splat. So let me play this section right here. So it's kind of a cartoon splat, right? We have this descending whistle and then a sharp, sounds like an egg hitting pavement to me. And that's what the graph looks like right there. And we're going to echo it. Now, in order to produce an echo, one of the first things that we need to do is we need to get a copy of the audio that we want, and then we need to delay it. 
So I'm going to give you just like a little example right here, and then we'll extend it to the audio clip itself. All right, so this is very basic. I created a column vector, four rows, one column, of the numbers one, two, three, four. And then I created a column vector of three zeros. And then I just stacked the zeros on top of the original column vector, and I displayed it out, and that's what it looks like. The zeros here represent my delay. So if these numbers represent my audio clip, if I can put some zeros at the beginning of my audio, I can delay it. And having a delayed audio clip is the first step to having an echo. So continuing on down, fill in the blanks here to make Y copy a delayed version of the original audio Y. And it's important that we don't clear our workspace because I'm using values that I declared in previous sections. So I am trying to keep things organized. Oh, you know what? That might not be true because I'm reloading splat here. I may have done that just for the whole purpose of not uh, needing to worry about clearing my workspace. But I may do that in later sections. So try to avoid running clear because you may delete things that you intend on using later on or that I intend on you using. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use Z right here as my vector of zeros. And how many zeros am I gonna put in? Well, I'm gonna put in this number of rows of zeros and then comma, one column. How did I come up with all this? Well, this I will explain later, but delay times fs. Well, delay is gonna be my delay in seconds, and fs is the number of samples per second that I want. So, samples per second times seconds, the units of seconds cancel, and I get samples. So this is how many zeros, how many samples I need to put in to get a quarter second delay. And then in Y copy right here, I actually don't need this line at all, so I'm going to get rid of it. What I'm going to do with Y copy is I'm going to put in the zeros at the beginning, semicolon, not a comma, because it's a column vector, and then Y, my copy of the original audio. And I recommend that you put in the semicolons and suppress the output because there's a lot of rows in the vector, and it's not very helpful to read the output, in my opinion. Now, you'll know you did it correctly if the size of Y copy... Oops, I forgot to fill this in. That's kind of funny. So uh, the size of Y copy is something like 12,000. We'll see in a second here. So let me just put in size of Y copy, and we'll see if we did it correctly. Um, and actually, one way that we can um, more easily evaluate if we did do this correctly is we can compare to the size of Y. All right, so here's the number of rows in Y, 10,001. Here's the rows in Y copy. It's longer. It's about 12,000. Great. That seems very reasonable. Continuing on down. The reason I used the uint64 right here, the reason I converted this double result, this result with a decimal place, to a 64-bit unsigned integer is that I can't have a half row or three quarters of a row in my zeros matrix or vector or in any matrix or vector. So I wanted to convert to a positive whole number. I didn't know how big my positive whole number needed to be, so I decided to use an integer as big as integers get in MATLAB, and that's what this will give me. So for example right here, suppose I try and have three rows and 2.5 columns. Well that's very silly. You can't have 2.5 columns. What does that even mean? Columns have to come in a whole number amount. All right, so now let's check it out. So here's a graph of my original and my copy with the delay. And you can see that there's all this zero flat nothingness right here before we get to the audio clip. And if you kind of overlay these over top of each other with your eyes, you can kind of see, hey, that looks like it could be the echo of the thing above it. All right, now the original and the copy are just numeric vectors. So can we just add them and get an echo? Will that work? Unfortunately, that will not work. Not because the concept is bad, but because the arrays have different sizes, right? We added all these zeros to the beginning of Y to generate Y copy, but Y is shorter. I mean, we just saw that when we displayed out their sizes. Can you think of a solution to this problem? It's actually really easy. Now, this example is probably not necessary, but it's showing how to add zeros to the end of a vector. That's right. All we have to do is the same process we did to Y copy, but to our original y vector, we just need to add the zeros at the end rather than at the beginning. So in this next section, we will do that. We'll uncomment these two lines right here. And this is going to be very similar to what we did before. In fact, this first line of code that I'm going to write with zeros here is going to be identical, 
we're going to do u int 64 of delay times fs, one column. In fact, I could have used the same z that I already have in memory from before. And then y is going to equal itself followed by beneath it, semicolon, z zeros. And now when I look at the length, I do a before and after of the lengths. Here are the lengths before, they're different. Here are the lengths after, they are the same. Seems like it's good. Let's check it out. Now, can I just add them together? Is it plus sign all we really need for an echo? <whistles> kind of, yeah, it is. So that's not bad. I just add them together and it kind of works. And there's our graph right there, we can see it. But we would like to make our echo a little bit better. So let's continue onward. Now, a real echo is going to be a little bit quieter than the sound that generated it. So I have this variable here named amplification. It's really going to be a suppression or a deamplification. Now, you could make the echo louder by making this bigger than 1, but I don't want to do that. I'm going to make it quieter. In fact, I'm going to make it 60% as loud. And to do that, I have you fill in the blank right here, and I think the hardest part about this is overthinking it um, because it's really not that hard. All I wanted here was y copy times amplification. So all my original values are multiplied by 0.6. Now they are 60%. Let's add it together and play the sound and see how it looks. All right. Now it's a little bit hard for me to hear. I can't hear that much of a difference, even though it's a pretty big reduction. But you can see it in the graph, right? You can see the reduction between the values of the original and the values in the echo. And so is that it? Well, it could be, but let's be professional about this. Audio files, these audio files at least, are supposed to have numeric values between negative 1 and 1. Let's look at the maximum and minimum in our echo vector here. They're close to 1 and negative 1, but both of them are actually out of bounds. So this is slightly too large, and this is slightly too negative. How can we fix it? Well, first I'm going to show you a simpler example. I'm going to generate 10 random numbers, and then print out their max and min, and I'm going to fix it so that these random numbers are between negative 1 and 1. All right, so here's my original values, randomly generated, and the maximum happens to be about 1.8, and the minimum is negative 1.6. And then after my normalization, the maximum is 1, and the minimum is negative 0.86. I was not expecting a negative 1 down here. I want to keep the relative difference between the values the same, right? So like the ratio of these first two numbers should be the same as the ratio of the second two numbers. And there we go, right? So relatively, the sound is the same. We're just normalizing it so that we're within 1 to negative 1. Not necessarily exactly 1 and exactly negative 1, but between those values. And the reason this is exactly 1 is because what I did was I ran this code right here. I looked at the maximum value. I looked at the minimum value. Lowest is not even quite the right word. It's most biggest in the negative direction. And then I took whichever was bigger, being careful to take the absolute value of that low negative value to see which is larger. And then I take all my values and I divide them by the larger number. So of course the maximum was one when I divided because it's divided by itself. All the other values are scaled by the same amount. And so now my max and min is within the range that I want. So now the task for the student or you is to do the exact same thing with your echo file. Now I'm going to cheat a little bit and just copy this code right here, just for a little bit of laziness there. And instead of v right here, I'm going to use echo. So get the biggest echo value, get the most minimal in the negative direction echo value, uh, get whichever of those is larger, including the positive version of this one, and then take my echo and set it equal to itself divided by the larger of the two values, dot slash element wise division although it actually doesn't matter since larger is a scalar. And let's see how uh, the minimums and maximums look, as well as how it sounds and looks on the plot. Still sounds exactly the same to me. My ears can't pick out the difference. And our maximum and minimums are between the requested values right here. So that is what we wanted. Now lastly, can we write this whole thing up as a function? So all of this we've put together, we've got the code working, we've tested it in very incremental small pieces, which is the way you should design code, especially if you're not super sure what you're doing. Can we put it into a function named echo gen? It's going to have the following inputs, the vector of original audio files, a sampling frequency, a requested delay in seconds, 
uh, requested amplification, which you can think of as a percentage. I'm using the exact same numbers and values as before, but that's okay. That'll help us evaluate whether we did it correctly. And it's going to return a new vector of audio. And we're going to graph the original, compare it to the new version, and play it out using the sound function. All right, so let's see how we would do this. Open up a new file, function. I'm going to name my return variable echo audio and set it equal to the name of the function, echo gen. I'm just going to go back over to the other file and copy in the variable names. No reason not to use the same names right there. And then we're going to do the exact same code that we wrote before. I'll probably speed this up, but I'll talk over it as I write it in. All right, we're going to get our Y copy to echo. Actually, before we do that, we're going to get our zeros, and I'm just going to name them Z. And how many of them do we need? Well, we're going to have a uint64 of the delay times the sampling frequency, only one column. And then Y copy is going to become those zeros, semicolon, the original audio. And the original audio is going to become itself followed by the zeros. And in fact, while we're here with the copy, let's actually just multiply it by the amplification. Might as well do it right there. And then our echo audio is going to equal Y plus Y copy. Except we got to be careful with those maximums and minimums. I'm going to go back and copy some of that code from the other file just because it's easy to do so and it's nicely set up right here. Now, whenever you're copying and pasting, you really have to be careful to check what you copied and pasted. Is it just going to work perfectly as is? No, because I changed my variable name. Now, I could just change this to echo and that would be easier, but I'm going to go ahead and make sure I change echo to echo audio in all these locations. Whenever you copy and paste, you need to still go through that code and make sure that there aren't any further changes you need to make. And also you should ask yourself why you're copying and pasting and make sure you have a good reason, especially in a classroom setting where the purpose is perhaps to practice and learn, not just to get a right answer. But all right, I think this is good, right? Get that buffer of zeros, put it at the beginning of the echo, put it at the end of the original, uh, deamplify the echo, add together the original and the echo, normalize it, I should really be putting in all the things I'm saying here as comments, but I'm just going to leave it for now for the video. And then let's save it. Save it as echogen.m. Go to echo exercise and scroll down to the bottom here. And let's see, does it work? Seems to work perfectly. And that is how to put an echo in an audio file. There is some more content down here at the bottom. It's just the original instructions for this question from the Coursera webpage. I may have even modified this a little bit. It might still be partly my edits to it, but it's the basic idea. I just wanted to keep that around in case I wanted to refer to it. And that's it, though. We're all done. My plan was for this to conclude my sequence of MATLAB videos. There's always the possibility that I discover some MATLAB content or topic that I want to include, and so maybe there will be further videos, but I don't anticipate that, and certainly not in the near future. So if you've watched all these videos, wow, thank you. Obviously, you got something out of it uh, since you made it all the way to the end with me. Um, I hope that I have been a benefit to you and you've learned something along the way and uh, enjoyed yourself at least a little bit. So thanks again. Good luck with your future MATLAB programming.